Welcome to Innovations in Education. I'm your host, David Adams, CEO of Urban Assembly. And on this show, we bring guests every single episode who have made things work in public education. And I got a story for you. The story starts in about 1997 when the first Urban Assembly School was built. It's called the Bronx School for Law, Government, and Justice. During that time, back in 1997, folks weren't really focusing on career pathways or career and technical education. Folks weren't really making connections between schools and post-secondary outcomes. Folks were uh, just starting to think about the notion of social and emotional learning. And folks really hadn't had faith in the New York City school system. In fact, during that time, the graduation rate was 47% across New York City. And it took the passion, it took the, the innovation, it took the energy of city leaders, of nonprofit leaders, of educators across the city to get us to where we are today. And at the Urban Assembly, our graduation rate is about 91%. And so this show is about the innovators. This show is about the folks who are solving problems. This show is about making things work in education. There's a lot of shows out there uh, talking about what's wrong in the education system, and those are great shows. There's a lot of shows out there talking about what we're not doing well, and there's great things to learn from those, but that's not this show. This show is going to be featuring educators who are making things work for young people and improving public education. And now I have the pleasure of introducing my good friend, Mike Palmer, who is the executive producer of this show. We're going to flip the script a little bit. And instead of having me interview him, he's going to interview me. And we're going to think about what innovations in public education look like for the story of the Urban Assembly. Thanks so much for the introduction, David. Really looking forward to this project. To begin, I'd like to hear a little more about who's going to be on the show in upcoming episodes. Who are you going to be interviewing? What are those conversations going to be like? Well, Mike, we got a lot of great guests coming up on the show. As we said before, this is a show about highlighting and spotlighting folks who have produced innovation in education. So our next guest will be former school's chancellor, Dr. Misha Ross Porter. And she's going to be talking about how she transformed the New York City school system in terms of reopening after COVID. After that, we have an outstanding interview from the Senior Advisor for Teaching and Learning at EL Education, Ron Berger, a good friend of mine, part of my crew, part of people who have re-envisioned and reimagined public education for across the country. So looking forward to these opportunities to have these folks on our show. What's great is that they both show the range of the ways in which people are making a difference. In the case of Misha, you know, working in the Bronx, growing up in Queens and in the Bronx, and then talking about the story, really her story, and how she wound up being a leader, an influencer through a really difficult time in New York City. A lot going on there. And then Ron is about as far from New York City as you could imagine in rural Massachusetts, talking about expeditionary learning, talking about you and he being out on the river. Any thoughts on, on those interviews, which are already available, by the way, if folks, if you're listening to this episode, you can listen to those other two interviews. And then each month we're going to be sharing similar interviews. But can you talk a little more about those two interviews? With Dr. Porter, we're really thinking about her path to become a school's chancellor. We're talking about her upbringing in Queens, moving to the Bronx, how she organized and really started to create the spark and inspiration for the Urban Assembly itself. And then how she took those ideas and those values all the way through her education career. And now as the executive director for the Bronx Foundation is revisiting those values and, and refocusing them on the Bronx itself to elevate the economic and social mobility of that borough. With Ron, we're really talking about the nature of education itself. We're talking about the role teachers and schools play in public society. We're talking about the students who he's inspired, the role of community and bonding, and how schools help create and elevate that. And our own experience, our own personal time that we had together on the Colorado River, where we thought about and we experienced this notion of crew and how we can bring that back to help the public education system increase and enhance democracy in our country. Yeah, it's it's a pretty powerful interview. I got to say the the idea of we are crew, not passengers is something I've continued to think about since that conversation. And so I really would encourage folks to don't just listen to this one and enjoy it. Also listen to the other two that are already out there. And then each month we're going to be releasing more of these. Can you talk about who else might be on or the types of guests, the types of conversations you're hoping to have over the course of the year? Well, we're going to identify and engage the public education leaders across the country, Mike. I don't want to tip my hat just yet, 
but I am telling you, we're going to have a lineup of the best education leaders in the country and beyond. And they're all going to be talking about how they've solved problems. So this is not about wringing your hands. This is not about feeling sorry for yourselves. This is about identifying folks who've actually made a difference and think about how we can replicate that difference in our own systems. Yeah. And then this platform can hopefully elevate awareness about folks who've done things right so that we can scale what they're doing. And then how about your story? What's your background? How's that going to relate to the conversations you're going to be having? Well, I am the Urban Assembly CEO, and I'm here to think about what it means to improve public education. Public education product myself, grew up in New Jersey, Union, New Jersey, uh, father of two kids, Elijah and Isaiah Adams, who are both in public schools over in Union, New Jersey, a uh, 19-year Army veteran, Army Reserve, a civil affairs officer, and 12 years married to my wife, Tamika Adams. During this entire time, really cared about public education. And if you want to know what I think about in terms of specifics and emotional intelligence and social emotional learning, I also author the book, The Educator's Practical Guide to Emotional Intelligence. You make a lot of the connections to social emotional learning. You bridge in a lot of ways, social emotional learning into the, the vocational component. Can you talk a little bit about how those two pieces relate to each other? If you look at the kinds of skills that employers want the K-12 system to produce immediately, they want problem solvers. They're looking for folks who can collaborate and work in groups. They're looking for folks with a work ethic who can set and achieve goals. And they're looking for folks who are really effective at communication. And when you're looking at the kind of hard skills, like what can be taught on the job, what are the content-oriented skills, a lot of employers are, are willing to teach those skills. But what you can't teach on the job really is how to show up to the job, how to work in groups, how to set and achieve goals. And so those are not just employability skills, those are social and emotional skills. And not only do they help us achieve the content, right, so that when you're reading and writing and problem solving within our school system, you're activating your social emotional skills, but they also are the skills that are the most highly prized. The most highly prized employees are the folks who are able to do this fluently, effectively, and in order to solve problems in groups. So this is the work. This is why employability skills and social emotional learning are important. And this is why the Urban Assembly has been leading this work since 1997, as we looked at career themed schools and incorporated these social emotional competencies into those schools here today, 2022, making public education think about this work as well. The geography that you're talking about, I know you recently did an epic tour of your 23 schools. Can you describe a little bit where you are? So first, Mike, it was epic. There were train rides, there were bus rides, there were cab rides. There was a whole lot of walking, about 19,000 steps. Me and my colleague, Alexis Goldberg, made sure we got to four boroughs here in New York City to see all 23 urban assembly schools. And what did we see in those schools? We saw small schools with individualized approaches to education, right? We like to think about these schools as specialized for all kids. I saw schools in, in, in Brooklyn where folks were in classrooms were about 15 to 20 so that each student could be supported in terms of their academic and social emotional growth. Obviously, I saw CTE schools, career and technical education schools, where our schools were really focused on the credentials that students could earn when they graduated high school. Saw schools on the water, on islands. I saw schools in parks in the Bronx, focused on green careers. But what I saw across all these schools were passionate educators, passionate educators dedicated to ensuring that their students were prepared for a community. That means that they understood the world and themselves, that they could solve problems, and that they know how to work in groups. That was the work, that was the trek, and I look forward to showing the entire country what our schools can provide in terms of what it means to improve public education and serve as that proof of concept. That leads a little bit to the question of measurement, which is always a question in education. How do you know that something is innovative? How do you know that something is moving the needle? How do you think about measuring outcomes? You know, Mike, I was reading an article today in the New York Times. It said child poverty in the United States had decreased since 1993 by about, I think it was 43%. I don't know yeah. if that was the number off the top of my head, right? But 43%. That's a huge number. I'm talking about 12 million kids, 12 million kids who are no longer in poverty in the United States. And so this is a show about making things work, making things work. Our graduation rate across the city, we haven't got the official rate, but it's going to be around 87, 88%. Mm. Those are 
millions of kids going out to be community ready, contribute to their communities through their intellect, through their passions, and through making things work in terms of their contributions to society. That's who can, folks can look forward to, uh, folks who know how to make things work, not writers, not folks who are just thinking, not pontificators, folks who rolled up their sleeves and got down like we do at the Urban Assembly, made things work on the local level, on the national level, on the international level, and young people benefited from their efforts. Where is the national conversation, the global conversation, the local conversation about this, and where do you think it needs to be? One of the important questions, Mike, that we need to really work through as a society is the purpose of education. What does it mean to be in a public school? And why do public schools exist? You know, one of the most important innovations, you talk about making things work, that has ever existed in public education is the public school itself. People don't realize it was the United States of America who created the idea, the concept of the common school, mm -hmm. uh, Horace Mann over there in Massachusetts. And that was the concept that scaled across the entire country and then really the entire world. So let's talk about that first innovation, a school funded by citizens in order for citizens to contribute to their society. Now we know that there was a lot, a lot of ways to go in that first innovation, right? We know that it excluded too many folks, too many Americans, too many folks who should be American, who are living in our country, who did not have access, folks who are black, folks who are enslaved. But we also know that it was that idea, that seed that blossomed into this tree that we see in front of us today. So we're sitting on a, a legacy of innovation in education in the United States. And the purpose of that innovation, the purpose of the common school was so that folks could participate in self-governance, so that folks could contribute to their society. England, the UK never innovated a public school because they didn't need their folks to be able to contribute to their society because they had a hierarchical society based on class. But here in the United States, we did better than that. And so that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the purpose of public schools. We're going to talk about what it means to contribute to their community. And we're going to talk about how public schools develop our ability as young people to contribute to their communities. Mm -hmm. That's reading, that's writing, that's arithmetic, that's also social emotional development. That's also community development. That's also civic development. It's also who we are as people, desegregation. All these things matter in terms of who we are at public schools. And that is why this show is called Innovation in Education. Mm -hmm. And then it is a time where the stakes are higher in education, the temperature is turned up, folks are very activated about education, perhaps more so than they ever have been before. And then you're espousing things that it, that is more controversial maybe than we were anticipating, or that at least I, I was anticipating. Social emotional learning is something that is actually withstanding a bit of a backlash these days. I'd love to get a little bit of your perspective. The stakes are high. There is some risk involved. Can you explain the stakes and where we are today in terms of our educational system? Yeah. Well, I mean, Frederick Douglass learned to read under threat of death, under candlelight. And that is what, when you talk about stakes, I'm talking about the Little Rock Nine desegregated schools in Arkansas under guard from the 101st Airborne Division. So we can talk about stakes when we talk about that. When we talk about stakes, let's talk about Medgar Evers and the work that he did and what he paid and the price that he paid for that in terms of what it means to participate fully in society. So we're talking about stakes here that are not the stakes of the folks who delivered us. We're talking about stakes here that need to be reflected and contextualized in the larger conversation about public education in our country. Reconstruction was the first real opportunity for folks, particularly who were formerly enslaved, to participate in formal education, protected by the United States military and then attacked as those schools were defunded and then defunded again in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, in particular during the civil rights movement, where entire counties closed down public schools so that Black people could not integrate those school systems. Education has always been high stakes. Folks have always risked their lives to participate in the American dream. And what we're talking about here today is nothing more, nothing less than the folks who delivered us here today. So we're just happy and I'm happy to be able to participate in that legacy. The times are ex especially challenging for everyone in light of the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of the transformative disruption of the last few years. Education has been very much front and center. What's it been like leading an education organization, getting to know students and educators? 
what's that experience been like? And what are your thoughts on where we're headed? Hopefully starting to come out of at least the first phase of the pandemic years. Yeah, I think the conversation has been to date around learning loss. And you and I talked about this a little bit before. That assumes that most students were reading at proficiency level across the city or across the country, and now they're falling behind. And that's not accurate. Uh, most students are not reading on uh, level. Uh, most students were not performing mathematics on level. Um, and so innovative schools have always identified opportunities to grow student outcomes. Uh, innovative schools have always understood where students at and where they needed to be and put in the effort in order to get them there. And urban assembly schools and other schools across the country are innovative schools. Our schools saw students coming in, coming from the pandemic, and adjusted our systems and structures to support them. Everything from an increased support around their social and emotional development to increasing their level of academic acceleration. And it's going to continue to be that story. It's going to be, continue to be the story in education of schools who are forced to solve problems who move our country forward. And I want to give a shout out to every single school who has not taken the easy way out, who have taken all students and served all students. And to the extent that we learn from those schools, and that's the guests that we're going to bring on, to the extent that we learn from those districts, our education system will improve, and we're going to be sitting here 10 years from now talking about 95% graduation rates, and not just graduation rates, but the kinds of young people who are ready to contribute to society. And that will be because folks like the guests that we bring on are successful in their mission, our teachers, our principals, our superintendents, our policymakers are doubling down on a vision of public education that serves all kids all the time. Yeah. And that all means all is something that probably worth emphasizing a little bit further and also emphasizing some of the risks of the counterexample where if public schools as an institution aren't there for us and for our kids, they're going to wind up being educated in less diverse, more siloed. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question of what it means to invest in public schools in order to produce young people who can operate in community. Now you have folks who talk about school choice and don't manage that school choice with this notion of a common good. Our school choice must be tempered by this notion of who we are in a universal context. There's a reason Brown versus Board of Education was decided in terms of desegregation. It was the desegregation case because separate but equal is not equal. And so a public good, a common good, a public school serves all kids. It serves all kids. And our job is to convince the public, to convince taxpayers, to convince parents that that public good is worth investing in, right? That that public notion, that common good is worthy of their child. And we're going to do that by solving problems. We're going to do that by innovating. We're going to do that by producing the best public schools that our kids deserve because public schools started here in the United States. And so all we got to do is live that legacy and we're going to do what's right by kids so that they can participate in society in a way that allows them to contribute to communities beyond the communities that they grew up in. Yeah. And, and that brings me to the notion of service, which I know is something that's been important to you through your military career and then your passion for education and giving something back to your communities. That's also very much built into the spirit of the urban assembly and the type of innovations that we'll be showcasing. Can you talk about the importance of service leadership, connection to the community? Absolutely. If you look at, I'd say, let me throw out a number, 90% of school visions, high school visions and missions and visions, they will talk about producing citizens, cultivating knowledge and producing citizens who contribute to their community. Ultimately, the highest form of development is one in which young people leave feeling an obligation to return that development back to the society, back to the institutions that helped invest in them. And so what we're looking to do when we're thinking about this idea of service is work with our young people to use our knowledge to improve institutions that they're a part of, that is to leave them better than they found them. And so that's the work. That's why our Urban Assembly students, if you look at the articles that come out in the paper, they are focused on building schools for students with disabilities. They are focused on learning CPR so they can contribute to their communities. They're focused on cleanup of common spaces so that more people can participate in them. 
And they're focused on this vision of public education that's more than just math and science, that's more than just reading and writing. It's about who we are in community. And that's why Urban Assembly exists. That leads me to the, this concept of the future of work and how work is changing and how in some ways maybe there's a misalignment in what we're taught in K-12 education and even higher ed and then what we're actually going to need when kids are entering a rapidly changing work environment. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about your thoughts about the future of work and about how some of the models that you have out there may give kids more of a head start in terms of being ready for the future? Yeah. The most important thing I think we are able to do right now in the K-12 system is to teach folks how to learn. The model in which you graduate go get a degree and live off of that degree for the rest of your life is obsolete. It's been obsolete for a little bit of time now. We know folks are upskilling and they're reskilling, and we know it's differential in terms of who is accessing those systems. We know men, for example, are accessing those systems at a lower degree than women are, and it is resulting in a workforce that's not necessarily matched to the labor market and the job descriptions that are out there. And so we need to really think about in, in the education system, being able to, one, uh, really name the skills that are being developed. There's content that we need to, to master as part of parcel of being educated, but there are also skills that are transferable to the real world. And a lot of those skills are the social emotional skills that we just talked about before. Being able to set and achieve goals, being able to infer from a character's manifestations, what they're feeling and thinking, and being able to persevere and solve problems, right? These are the hidden curriculum as it were that really are unhidden when you go out into the world of work. You're solving nebulous problems. They don't have really clear solution sets in groups and activities. I think what we need to do, and this is the work that's happening in New York right now, is we need to be clearer around the skills, the social and emotional competencies, and the translation of those skills and social emotional competencies to the types of problem sets that exist in the world. And those are problems that are not clear. They don't have equal signs attached to them. They are nebulous, as it were. And it's going to take the intellect. It's going to take the hard work. It's going to take the perseverance of every young person to move us forward. And I'm going to say one more thing about this, Michael, because I think the pandemic is really a good example about this. People thought the most important problem set was the technical one. That is, how do we get a vaccine out to millions of people as fast as possible? And it was a technical marvel. The scientists were out there doing what scientists do and like the logistics people were doing what logistics people do. And in fact, that was not the problem set that constrained vaccination rates. Do you have a vaccine? The problem set that constrained vaccination rates was a people problem. How do we convince people that this is a safe an important way to contribute to society. And most problems that are really vexing are people problems. And most problems that are really challenging are problems of society. And so we need to think about, when we talk about the world of work, we can't just narrow our scope of education to saying, can you do this technical task? Because the same person who is your worker is also your citizen. Right? They're also solving problems for how to be in community. They're solving problems for how to negotiate and navigate different values of different people. And so the, the K-12 education system is asked to do multiple things at the same time. And that's why we talk about preparing people for community as the end state here, because work is part of how you contribute. One way to contribute to community. Another way is volunteering. Another way is civic development. Another way is voting. But we need to be able to do all of those things in our K-12 system effectively. And that's why we need these innovative folks to help us think about how to solve for all these challenges in one system at one time so that our young people can do all the things that we expect them to do to participate in our society. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. It reminds me of the notion of the culture is so critical and building a culture of psychological safety. A big part of your culture includes your teachers and your administrators and your staff. Can you talk about that side of your ecosystem and how they contribute and how you think about them and, and, and where innovation happens? Oh, yeah. Mike, innovation happens in urban assembly schools. We have a strategic priority that talks about find out what's already working. I have a big belief that those who are closest to the problem have the most innovation solution sets. And for reasons that I'm not quite clear of in education, we tend to have somebody write a book 
And then we all have to do what this person writes in a book rather than really just studying who are solving problems. And this goes back to your question about metrics. What are the metrics that we're using to understand high quality schools? And I would argue growth, academic growth is an important one. Supportive environments is next. And connection to the workforce is the last, right? And so when we're able to produce academic growth, when the learning environments are strong and then are connected to the workforce in terms of relevance, those are high quality schools. And so when we go around to our schools, we look and we say, you know, hey, who is solving really well for a question of literacy growth in ninth grade? And how do we take what we are already doing, codify that and scale that so that more people can have access to that? Yeah. And this is such, I think, honor to our teachers and our principals because we go to them and have them teach us how to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. And so I think the better we are at looking at what's working and then scaling what's working, the better we are at solving problems in public education. And so uh, I appreciate, you know, we, I did uh, 19,000 steps in one day to see all of our, our schools and, and partnership with my managing director of school support. That is only a fraction of the effort that our school leaders put forth every single day to make sure that young people are prepared to participate in our communities. The other group that we haven't really talked as much about is your students and perhaps their families and the communities that they come from. Can we hear a little more about how they contribute to the environment and how you think about innovations in education as they relate to your students and their families and their communities? Absolutely. We talk about social emotional development. One of the key concepts of social emotional development is how do we work with young people to make responsible decisions? Students will use effective choice making, decision making skills. And the only way for young people to develop effective decision making skills is to give them decisions to make, right? Like real decisions to make that are impactful, that have to weigh different values and systems and constraints. And so at the UA, we are so deeply de devoted to this notion of how do we create spaces for young people to make decisions? How do we create spaces for young people to discuss big ideas, to prepare them for a society in which they will be responsible for discussing and solving big ideas? Our K-12 system is designed for young people to help move society forward. That's the point, right? That's the idea there. And we do that in community. So to the extent that our young people are in our classrooms discussing, having conversation about problem sets that they're learning about, to the extent that our young people are participating in school governance, solving problems for the community, solving problems for their classrooms, to the extent that our young people are in conversations with adults, identifying things that are important to them, is the extent that we are preparing young people to participate in a society that asks them to govern themselves. That's what we care about. That's how we organize our systems and structures of the Urban Assembly. And that's what our people and our guests are going to be talking about as well. Been an amazing conversation. Really looking forward to listening to these other ones. Any concluding thoughts, David, as we kick off our first season of innovations in education? Well, Michael, we all are the change that we want to see in the world. And going back to that conversation with Ron, we are crew, not passengers. And so we all have an opportunity to make this education system a little bit better for our children. And when we take that opportunity, our education system will improve. Thanks for listening to our latest episode of Innovations in Education, where we bring education leaders who have made things work in the education sector. If you like this episode, please subscribe so that you can hear more great content around innovations in education. I've been your host, David Adams. Have a great day.